good morning. morning. If you were here last week, you know that uh, I'm going to do a recap, and today is the second installment of a 19-part series. Um, (laughs) I was going to keep a straight face and say, you know, why are you laughing, but it was, it's not 19 parts, it's 39. Um, (laughs) Last week, the title was Worshiping in Integrity, Pleasing to the Lord. We had the passage in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, the only thing that we have to offer God is ourselves. And even for the best among us, it is not much of an offering. Not really being tongue-in-cheek about that is basically saying that look at who we are and look who God is and just think about what are you presenting to Him. We are woefully inadequate. We are the recipients, those who believe, of a grand exchange, a great exchange where our sin exchanged for His righteousness. Even for the best among us, it's not much of an offering, but it is what the Lord has determined to be good, what pleases Him. God has not asked us for anything He has not equipped us for. He simply has called His children to know Him according to His revealed Word, not to embellish, not to add, but simply to know Him as He has revealed in His Word and love Him accordingly. If we knew Him, we would love Him. This means that we would hold nothing back for ourselves. We would gladly give all that we have to Him, even demonstrating our confidence in Him by casting every care on Him, knowing that He cares for us. Christ had mentioned this in John 4.24. He said, God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. David in Psalm 51 said the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. True worship, true worship is a response of adoration and praise prompted by the truth that God has revealed. Last week we looked at the relationship between spirit, truth, worship. We said that our truth, our knowledge, our understanding, our truth must conform to His truth. Our spirit must conform to His spirit and our worship must be His worship. Acceptable worship, therefore, comes from one who is humble, believes God, trusts all His promises, punitive and propitious. This again is a quote from Pastor Sellers from a couple weeks ago. Acceptable worship comes from one who is humble, believes God, trusts all His promises, punitive and propitious, one who submits joyfully to God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. This is true. It's from Scripture. But who among us submits joyfully to God's good, acceptable, and perfect will? Even when we have good times of fellowship with God, and maybe on occasion we are deeply thankful and praising Him, We know that we struggle with that being a lasting feeling. But when He calls us to submit to Him, He does not ask us to do it grudgingly or miserly. He wants us to take joy in knowing Him and worshiping Him according to His standard. Who among us submits joyfully? The Bible clearly indicates that our nature, apart from God's intervention, is simply not able. According to Psalm 51, we were all brought forth in iniquity. We were all conceived in sin. According to Jeremiah 17, all of our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. According to Romans 3, none of us are righteous. Not one. None of us understands. None of us seeks for God. We have all turned aside, become worthless. No one does good. No one pleases the Lord Not even one. This was the bad news 
when he talked about spirit, truth, and worship. The bad news is that we cannot do this and we cannot honor him as we ought to. Our nature, which is ruled by sin and self-interest, our nature is to put ourselves ahead of God. And as such, we cannot worship him properly. We do not love him as we ought. But God is good and there is good news. And I know that we know the good news, but the good news, there's even good news before the good news. Here's, here's some additional good news. God knows who we are. He knows our abilities. He knows our limitations. He knows that if I go back to the bad news, we were brought forth in iniquity, we're conceived in sin, our hearts are deceitful, they're desperately wicked. We do not please Him in any way, shape, or form. And He knows that. But He's made a way. We could not make this way. He made the way for us. In fact, I like Luke 18. I mean, we like all these, but Luke 18, 27 says what? The things which are impossible with men, which it was, are possible with God. According to John 3, those who are born again, meaning those who believe in the person and work of Jesus Christ, they shall have eternal life. Because of the work of Christ, because of what the Lord has done, we can now know or believe rightly. According to Ezekiel chapter 36, the heart of stone, the heart of stone that was part of our nature, the heart of stone that is opposed to the will of God, it can be replaced with a heart of flesh that enables us to feel rightly, so we can think rightly, we can feel rightly. And according to 1 Thessalonians 1.9, those who have turned from idols to serve the true and living God, that means that we can worship rightly. We can, even though prior to the work of the Holy Spirit, prior to the work of Christ, when we had no capacity to please God whatsoever, we were abject failure. He has made a way whereby we, in our limited state, in our sinful capacity, can be transformed such that we might know, such that we might feel, such that we might Worship in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. This is good news indeed. God didn't leave us in our right and damnable state, but through the truth and His Spirit, He has provided salvation and the power to walk therein. By God's grace, we might love Him as He deserves with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. By His grace, we might again offer worship that is pleasing to the Lord, which is our reasonable service, as intended from the very beginning, from the time of creation itself. So on the wall behind and what you saw with VBS, the theme to a large extent was what? We are made in the image of God. And so I have a quote here from the Dutch theologian Herman Bavink. He says, The entire world is a revelation of God a mirror of His virtues and perfections. Every creature is in His own way and according to His own measure an embodiment of a divine thought. But among all creatures, only man is in the image of God, the highest and richest revelation of God, and therefore head and crown of the entire creation. If we go back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, this should be familiar to many of us, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. The prior creative acts that the Lord had on the previous days were basically creating out of nothing by speaking. But this is the first time when he actually says what? I will imbue my image on this creation. R.C. Sproul has a series of uh, From Dust to Glory. And he also has a book that he co-wrote with Robert Wolgamuth, which I think is um, What's in the Bible. And so I'll draw a couple of comments here from them. Uh, R.C. Sproul, Dr. Sproul says there is an analogy of being, an analogy of being between God and man. Man is not exactly like God, but there are ways in which he is like God. 
To bear the image of God includes being an intelligent being, having a moral nature, having a personality, reflecting the glory of God. As such, we are able to participate in this incredible phenomenon called thinking, reflecting, deciding, learning, feeling, and knowing. This is our existence. This is the sum total of who we are. And the question becomes, why did he make us in this image? And if you read through some of the theological arguments for creation and purpose, it gets deep and it gets really quite thoughtful and sometimes it's difficult to navigate. But we'll focus here on the fact that he, of his own prerogative, desired to have relationship. He wanted to have fellowship. He wanted us to be able to interact with him in a way in which creation outside of man could not. Dr. MacArthur in his, uh, I think the study Bible says, man is a living being capable of embodying God's communicable attributes. In his rational life, man is like God in that he could reason and has intellect. In the moral sense, he was like God because he was good and sinless. Whereas, now this is uh, not him, but whereas all of creation recorded in the opening of Genesis testifies to the glory of God, man, created in his image, has the special privilege of fellowship and relationship to God. No other part of creation has this privilege. Our Creator has endowed us with a mind, a heart, and a will so that we may think like Him, feel like Him, and make decisions that would be pleasing to Him, which we would call worship. Unfortunately, the Edenic Fellowship did not endure. If you read through Genesis 3, it's revealed that there was a compromise of truth. There was a compromise in the spirit and there was unacceptable worship. The compromise of truth was a corrupt understanding of God's word. If you go back, you can find Satan casts aspersions and Eve re recalls what the Lord had said to her and it wasn't quite right. There was also a compromised spirit, and the compromised spirit was the fact that self-interest eclipsed trust in God. The Lord had given a command, said, do not do this. But the response is basically, but I have a desire. And my desire prompts me to do that which is contrary to your will. There was an unacceptable worship. Basically, truth was overridden by desire. And any time that truth and spirit are corrupted, it leads to disobedience and rebellion. Unless you think I'm talking about Eve, this applies to Adam. Adam compromised truth. Adam's spirit was not where it ought to be. And his worship was unacceptable. Man was rightfully expelled from the garden. That was God's prerogative because he's a holy God. And this was sin. Man was rightfully expelled from the garden, but not without hope. When the Lord expelled them from the garden, he made pronouncements. Pronouncements to the serpent, pronouncements to the woman, pronouncements to Adam. And one of the pronouncements <clears throat> was that there would be hope. Without his promise of her seed, that's how it was referred in uh, Genesis 3.15, Okay, um, talking about the serpent will bruise his heel and he will crush the serpent's head. Her seed will do this. Without his promise of her seed defeating the serpent, man would have no hope of reconciliation. This protevangelium or first gospel, this is our only way back to acceptable worship. You understand there was acceptable worship. It was corrupted. There was an expulsion. The only means to restoration had to come from God through His work. And He gave us Christ. Another uh, theologian, Anthony Hukama, he says this, because we're looking at the image of man, 
or I'm sorry, the image of God, man made in the image of God. He says this, we must still see fallen man as an image bearer of God, but as one who by nature, apart from the regenerating and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, images God in a distorted way. So even in this fallen state, we still bear the image of God, but it is marred. It is not what it ought to be. In the process of redemption, that distortion is progressively taken away until in the life to come, we shall again perfectly image God. Here on earth, we improve through the power of the Holy Spirit, culminating in what? Perfect worship in heaven yet again. We had perfect, acceptable worship, but we lost it. And we can't go back and reclaim it. But the Lord God has provided a way. After the fall, compromised image bearers could no longer function as intended. God, however, in His grace and mercy provided the means of reconciliation through His Son, through His Son, who is the Logos, who is the truth, and enables us to live and worship acceptably through His Spirit. God Himself provides truth and Spirit so that we might be reconciled to Him, so that we might offer worship that is acceptable and pleasing to Him for our blessing, but for His glory. The work of the Holy Spirit is essential to any hope of reconciliation with God and worthy of a lifetime of meditation and study. So many passages through Scripture reveal His work, often behind the scenes, as it were. So much so that many of us shamefully disregard or diminish His role within the Godhead. You take that for what it's worth, but there's truth to the fact that we talk about God, we exalt Christ, which is right and proper, but many times we basically diminish the role and the work of the Holy Spirit to some sort of ancillary. He's also there as the third wheel. And the issue is, He's God. He is worthy. He is deserving. And yes, I understand that He has a role that is specific to His person. But... So many passages through Scripture reveal His work, often behind the scenes, as it were, so, many, so much uh, so that many of us shamefully disregard or diminish His role within the Godhead, Godhead, let alone our lives. This is unfortunate and it's offensive. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. As such, He has personality, meaning He possesses intellect and ability to reason and think. He possesses emotion and ability to feel. And He has a will and ability to choose. He is a person. And I just want to mention that this message this morning is not going to be a full or even a, a modest exposition on the Holy Spirit. That really would be multiple messages. So much Scripture that goes through. So I have some private notes and some material that I have from home, but I also have a small pamphlet that I have from Grace to You that's called The True Work of the Holy Spirit, and it is rich. And even though it's succinct, it's deep. And even though it might only be 15 pages or so, you could just expound, glorify, exalt the Holy Spirit for what He does, how He is transformational endlessly. But the Holy Spirit, I want us to understand, is first of all a person. In John 14, 26, He teaches and He reminds us. It says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. In Acts 13, 2, He spoke. He called. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to Me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In 1 Corinthians 2, 10, He searches. God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit is, first of all, a person. The Holy Spirit can be affected as a person. Acts 7.51 says that He can be resisted. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit only ever intends the best for you. 
The Holy Spirit has never called you to do anything that is not in your very best interest, but we resist. We fight. Acts 7.51 says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. In Ephesians 4.30, it says that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. It says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption because you can grieve Him. Do not do that. And 1 Thessalonians 5 says that He can be quenched. It says, Do not quench the Holy uh, the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is first of all a person. He can be affected as a person. The Holy Spirit indwells the believer. In Sunday school, we're talking about John chapter 4, which we did last week, where Christ is speaking to the woman at the well, and there's a question about acceptable worship, and He says, God is truth. Those that worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Well, the question at hand was, do we worship up on the mountain, or do we go to the temple in Jerusalem? And the Lord says, neither. And when we get to later material, you are the temple. You are the place of worship. And the temple is where the Spirit of the Lord dwells. Christ promised the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 17. He said, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees. And this is also, this is His word. Listen to this. The Spirit of truth who the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Christ refers to Him as a person. Christ is saying that He will be in you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we have a knowledge of Him. It says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And the Holy Spirit, we have a responsibility to Him. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Understand that my point in today's message again is not to just exhaustively go through the roles and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but really to impart the understanding that apart from the Holy Spirit, we are dead in sin and trespass. We cannot worship God rightly at all. Here it turns out, you, we cannot please Him. We are incapable unless what? Unless the Holy Spirit does a transformative work in our lives. And this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. His Spirit bears witness with our spirit. In Romans 8.16, it says that the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. He helps in our weakness. He intercedes on our behalf. Romans 8 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. His language is beyond our language. His ability to express is far beyond what we have. Thank God that He is interceding, that He is doing what we cannot do. Verse 27 says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He, the Spirit, makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. If we are to honor the Holy Spirit, treating Him with reverence and respect that is His royal due, we must rightly discern His true ministry. So this quote is coming from the pamphlet. And the question becomes, so what is the true ministry according to Scripture of the Holy Spirit. Here it is. Aligning our hearts, our minds, and wills with His wondrous work. He is restoring us, enabling us to do what? Worship God in a way that is pleasing to Him, that is honorable to Him. The Holy Spirit enables us to love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. This is what we are called to do as the first and greatest commandment. And the issue is, apart from Him, 
We can't do any of it. But thank God for the Holy Spirit. He creates spiritual life, regenerating sinners through the gospel of Jesus Christ and transforming them into children of God. The Holy Spirit sanctifies them. He equips them for service. He produces fruit in their lives. He empowers them to please their Savior. Apart from the Holy Spirit, you have no help. You have no hope. You do have help. You have no hope of pleasing the Lord. The Holy Spirit secures them for eternal glory and fits them for life in heaven. I think this is fully worthy of consideration. Just a few moments ago, I mentioned the bad news. The bad news is that we are conceived in iniquity. Our hearts are deceitful, desperately wicked. No one does good. No, not one. Incapable. Now, think about this. Preaching. We talked about preaching last week because if we want to know truth, one of the primary means that the Lord uses to impart truth is preaching the Word. Not giving lectures on things that we want to give uh, talk about that are of interest to us in a secular sense or even in an intellectual sense, but preaching the Word. But understand this, preaching about human depravity. I, I went back to that bad news before because conceived in iniquity, heart's deceitful, no one does good. Just so that we're clear, that's not a compliment. Okay, there's, there's nothing redemptive about this. There is no iota in there where there, there's some silver lining. You do not come with an upside there is no potential in you to basically say, well, I know that I'm mostly bad, but I've got some redeeming quality. You don't. Now think about this. Preaching about human depravity, about God's holiness and eternal punishment is not popular, especially in a postmodern society that celebrates tolerance. This is not how you go out and win friends and influence people is to tell them about their depravity to tell them how they fall short, how they are deserving of eternal damnation. That is not a winner from a secular perspective of talks that would be relatively well received and invited. But it is the only ministry empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let that sink in. The Holy Spirit calls us to go out and do what? Speak the truth, and love. We are not responsible for the outcome, for the results, for the consequences. What are we called for? Be faithful. Be faithful to the Word of God. Do not embellish. Do not change. Speak the truth. Let the Holy Spirit do His work. He is the power behind the preaching of the Gospel, using His Word to draw sinners to their Savior and regenerate them. Arthur Pink has this comment. He says, no one, none, he says, none. None will ever be drawn to Christ savingly by mere preaching. There must be first supernatural operations of the Spirit to open the sinner's heart to receive the message. The Holy Spirit does supernatural sanctifying work. He convicts unbelievers of sin he convicts unbelievers of sin. This is the power behind the preaching of the Word. He regenerates sinful hearts. That means that He quickens us. He transforms, cleanses, renews. He makes us usable. He transforms us from a worthless state to a state that has value. The Holy Spirit brings sinners to repentance. He imparts gifts of repentant faith. He enables fellowship with God. He enables us to have communion, to have fellowship with God. He indwells the believer. He empowers them. He equips them. He ministers the very gifts He has given us. First off, we don't have anything to offer. And so here comes the Holy Spirit and He provides us with gifts. And you can read about this through multiple passages in Scripture. And it turns out that He then doesn't say, here's your gift, now you're on your own, good luck. He says, I will give you the gift and I will give you the power to administer the gift, but not for your glory, for His will, for His glory. And the Holy Spirit seals salvation forever. He is our pledge of inheritance. This is how we know that we're His child. He's the down payment. He's the earnest money. The work of the Holy Spirit is supernatural. It is above and beyond anything that we can conceive. Created in God's image, His supernatural influence, here we go, 
It affects our intellect, our emotions, and our will. So sanctification is the process whereby the Holy Spirit conforms us to that good and perfect image of Christ. And the image of Christ is the perfect incarnation of the image of God. That is the model to which we aspire. And the Holy Spirit is working in our lives that we might be what? Become more and more like Him. The sanctifying act that the Holy Spirit does, it affects our intellect. Now this part is from Wayne Grudem in his book on systematic theology. Uh, sanctification affects our intellect. Paul says that we have put on the new nature, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. That's from Colossians 3.10. Paul also prays that the Philippians may see their love abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. We talk about being renewed in knowledge. We talk about abounding in knowledge and all discernment now in Philippians. In Romans, he urges the Roman Christians, we've read this before, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The point being what? The Holy Spirit is at work in our intellect. Paul also says that this knowledge of God, our understanding of truth, should keep increasing throughout our lives. Colossians 1 says, A life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, is one that continually increases in the knowledge of God. And the sanctification of our intellects will involve growth and wisdom and knowledge as we increasingly take every thought captive to obey Christ and find that our thoughts are more and more the thoughts that God Himself imparts to us in His Word. There is a transformation in which our thoughts, our understanding, are supposed to conform to that of God's. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit also affects our emotions. Galatians 5.22 We will see increasingly in our lives emotions such as love, joy, peace, Patient. There's a whole list in Galatians chapter 5. We will visit that in a few minutes. Sanctification also <clears throat> leads to an uh, increasingly obey Peter's commandment or Peter's command to abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. We will find it increasingly true that we do not love the world or things in the world, but that we like our Savior, delight to do God's will. These are all emotions that we're talking about. We're talking about abstaining. We're talking about loving. We're talking about delighting. There is no shortage. We as Christians are not supposed to be devoid of feeling. Okay? We are not supposed to be uh, one-dimensional, which is that, oh yes, we know things, but we don't feel anything about them. We are feeling beings. We have personality. We just need to feel rightly. And again, we need to be conformed. In ever increasing measure, we will become obedient from the heart and we will put away the negative emotions involved in bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. So there are emotions that we ought not to be so well known for, especially not in the inappropriate context. Sanctification also affects our will. So it affects our intellect, our emotions, our will. Our will is our decision-making faculty because God is at work in us to will and to work for His good pleasure. Passage after passage in Scripture calls us to holiness, to deny self, to conform to the image of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit that we might worship acceptably, that we might be fit for service, that we might be fit for blessing, that we might be fit for life as the Lord has called us, that we might be fit for worship today and for all eternity. Last week, we had used John 4, 24, where Christ is talking to the woman at the well to discuss spirit and truth, that we have to have those two components rightly calibrated by God to have acceptable worship. If you went back earlier in the story, which I'm going to read here, we're going to find that Christ encountered the woman at the well. And this passage is really what gives the subtitle here, Drawing from the Infinite Well. It says here in John chapter 4, verses 1 to 14, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, 
uh, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So Christ is offering something that will last for how long? Forever. Can you ever exhaust its supply? Oh no, it's overflowing. It's inexhaustible. It's an infinite well. If I do things appropriately right now, I hope that we would understand that the Holy Spirit likewise is making provision for us that He will make available to us whatever we need and we cannot exhaust His supply. We can never outgive God. He would even almost say, try. Try and go out and do these things that are contrary to your nature. I will empower you to do them. And you say, oh, I do not have enough. You always have enough. You will never come up short and He doesn't call us to do things that He does not equip us to do. So I say here, can we exhaust the rich resources and generous blessings of the Holy Spirit? Well, no. But it's not like anyone has ever really tried. His desire, the Holy Spirit's desire, is to see Jesus honored and God exalted. He, as God, has no limit to His power. To that end, the Holy Spirit has blessed us with inexhaustible gifts that He Himself superintends if we allow. Yes, we can resist Him. Yes, we can grieve Him. We can quench Him. But if we don't, He actually grants us. Watch this one. Supernatural understanding of truth. He grants us supernatural feeling. He grants us supernatural ability to worship and to fellowship with God. This is incomprehensible. The natural man cannot, you will be laughed derisively, mocked incessantly for you to believe this. But this is what the Holy Spirit is saying is that I have for you that which you could never comprehend on your own, but it will be supernatural. These gifts come from Him, from an inexhaustible supply. There's no rationing that must occur. There's no optimization or efficiency that you have to be concerned about. There's no restraint placed on doing good. After you have done good, what are you supposed to do? More good. And once you're done there, what should you do? More good. In fact, you should never not do anything that is... Wait a second, I messed it up. You should never stop doing good. And if you should ever suggest, well, I might run out, that's not good. He is the source of our ability to do that which we could not do of ourselves. In fact, we're encouraged to not grow weary in well-doing. There's an expression, and it implies that, look, you know what? Watch this, and this is going to be true. Doing well takes a toll. And it's not a small toll. It is actually going to be devastating to who you are. But the Lord will use it for good. And he says, I want your reasonable service and I will equip you to do that which is pleasing to me. But you cannot do it on your own. You must do what? You must draw from the infinite well. In fact, we're encouraged not to grow weary. The cost is real. The sacrifice will leave scars. But there's always more grace in the infinite well. 
when we talk about supernatural, you can imagine how things get spooky and weird in our culture. But do we understand that obedience to the Holy Spirit leads to an understanding that is beyond our natural comprehension. It leads to emotive responses that are far beyond what we would ever do in our flesh. And it's the only means of leading to worship that could actually glorify God as He is worthy. Here are some examples. You know, do you have a supernatural understanding of truth? Because you can imagine someone saying, that's, that's ridiculous. I know that they won't like it at the university. I know that they won't like it out in the community. Just give it a thought, you know, is there anything that you know because the Holy Spirit has revealed it to you? Yeah, it's a lot. It is God. The fact that He exists, your acceptance of His existence, is not, that's not your own rational thought here. That's the Holy Spirit making something aware to you. Guess what? The fact that His Word is His Word, that is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Christ Jesus, what He has done who he is. You do not know that through empirical sciences. You do not know that through purely rational thought. You can only know that through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Knowing him. You cannot know that apart from him. You can't know sin. You can't know redemption. You can't know eternity. You can't know heaven. You can't know hell. You can't know prayer. You can't know virtue. You cannot know peace. You cannot. This list goes on and on. It turns out that the Christian has insight that the rest of the world simply cannot appropriate. Why are you sitting on it? You have been empowered, I have been empowered beyond all nature to do things that are supernatural, and yet most of the time I live as the world. It's almost like, oh yes, I have all this stuff, but I'm saving it. And it turns out that no, let it start with a supernatural understanding, if you believe. Recognize this though, this list does not do the Bible justice. And this list, you could have greater understanding even beyond these things, if you have faith. He tells us that if we exercise faith, what will He do? He will teach us more. He will teach us more. It's again one of these things, well, we don't know things because we don't ask for them, because we're disobedient. And I'll tell you what, if I have disobedient children, I lose interest in teaching them things too. The Lord does this and He says, I have an inexhaustible well saved up for you, ready to pour out to you, but what do you do? You never ask. The natural man denies the reality of everything that I just said. They do it through disbelief. They say that is a losing proposition. That is foolishness to them. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness and they often fabricate counterfeits to fill the void left by everything that they don't believe. Everything. Love. God. Holiness. It's incomprehensible. It's distasteful. It's rejected. So what do I need to do? I need to fill something. Why? Because being created in His image, we're looking for this. And when I say that we're looking for this, I'm not saying that we're seeking after God because I've already heard in Romans what? Romans 3. We don't. We don't seek after Him at all. But it does turn out that we can't be satisfied until our image starts to conform to the image of Christ. That's where that power is. None of those lists that can be appropriated through empirical or natural means they have no fear of the Lord. I put that in because what does it say in Proverbs? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. Supernatural understanding. Examples of supernatural feeling. Well, you know, what supernatural feeling do we have? Well, I'll just go right to Galatians. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I don't have to stop there, by the way, but for the interest in time, you get the message. The Bible is full of it. Do you understand that this is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? The list is not exhaustive. Additional items could include all that is not condemned as well. And we'll see that in another passage I have coming up, which is that, well, not only is there this fruit, but you also abstain from these other things. So sometimes we'll be identified by what we don't pursue. And the thought here is that this is, is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, meaning what? Apart from the Holy Spirit, you do not have these. But I know people, and they say that they love things. And I know people, and they say that they're at peace. What does the Word of God say? You don't. 
They have taken something else that is ungodly and they've labeled it with these labels. And they say, oh, look, we do this too. And the Lord says, you don't know what you're talking about. You, you do not have any capacity to do this. And when I say this, I am not lording it over anyone. I'm saying, thank God. I thank God that I know something about this through the power of the Holy Spirit. My desire is not to exalt myself, but to share it, to spread it, to, to, to glorify God, to tell you how awesome He is, even if you're rejecting Him right now at this moment. The natural man redefines every virtue I just mentioned to accommodate self-interest. When they look at love, when they look at words like what is good, what is nice, what is reasonable, they always go back to themselves in terms of this is what I would like. This is what would be pleasing to me. They are not defining terms where when the Lord calls us to love people, guess what it means? You sacrifice for the true good of another person. You pay a price for someone else. You bear the cost. To the secular world, that's a bad decision. Why should I be paying for everyone else's benefit when I'm not getting anything out of it? Well, the believer says, I, I got way more out of it than I ever anticipated. This is the least that I can do. But the secular mind says what? Foolishness. The secular mind wants to present an appearance of virtue, but it denies the power thereof. Is that everything that we're talking about? If we do it God's way, it's again a losing proposition. None of these can be genuinely manifest apart from the Holy Spirit because it is His fruit. It's not our fruit. It's His fruit through us. But we can resist and we can quench. Examples of supernatural worship. The believer, not the unbeliever, can show supernatural worship. And I'll just start with these three. Grace. Mercy, forgiveness. I want to mention them. Because are we called to exhibit or to manifest grace? Are we called to show mercy? And are we called to forgive? Every single one of those things that the Lord finds pleasing will cost you. It will cost you. And if you try to go through a calculus and you say, well, is it worth it? Is it worth it? If you do not have God, you cannot extend grace. If you do not have God, if you do not have the work of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be merciful. You cannot forgive. Some of the time you'll hear people talk about forgiveness and they're, they're doing it in a uh, the role of a disbeliever. And the notion is basically, well, I will forgive them under these conditions. Is that how we are to forgive? No. When we express love, are we supposed to uh, anticipate reciprocity? That if I give you this much, uh, this would be me, by the way, in my nature, natural state. When I give, I don't even expect a commensurate amount in return. I expect tenfold. I am just that wicked in my disposition. It is something which is, hey, I did you a small favor, now you owe me a big one. And the Lord says, no, no, no. You do whatever favor the Spirit is calling you to exhibit. And the Lord says, I, I will pay the bill. I'll pay for it. You go out and you give of yourself and you give 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 and, you give and do not take payment from anyone. Why? Because the Lord says, I've already paid in advance. I have given you all that you need. You are equipped to do things that the world needs and the world rejects, but the Lord calls you to do them. Grace, mercy, forgiveness, we can do these. We couldn't do them before. We can witness now. We can glorify God and give thanks. We couldn't do that before. We can deny ourselves. We had no capacity to deny ourselves before. That's in fact all we ever did was just award ourselves, give in to ourselves. Now we can deny ourselves. We can help other people. We can actually go from being a curse to all mankind to actually being a blessing on behalf of God. But this is predicated on supernatural truth, supernatural spirit that we mentioned before. And with those, we can worship God as He deserves to be worshipped. We can do good. Romans 3 no longer applies in the sense that whereas before we were incapable, now we're empowered. We can extend grace because we've been shown grace. We can extend mercy 
and forgiveness because we've been extended mercy and forgiveness. No matter how much we dish out, no matter the cost, we always win. We always win. We've won already. The question is, do you believe that? Because this is what the Spirit is telling us. The Spirit is telling us that this life is not that significant. It's the one to come. We already have the victory. Start living like victors, not like victims. I want you to pour out the goodness that God has poured into you that others might know Him, that others might glorify Him. The natural man sees all of this as utter foolishness, fundamentally wasteful, and he's not indifferent to it. The natural man condemns this behavior. It suggests that if we were to teach anyone else to act this way, that we should be stopped, that we should be incarcerated, that we should be disappeared. Think about other nations that don't want this promulgated within their community because it creates independent agents that are no longer under the government's authority. It's independent agents who are under God's authority and say, government, I will submit to you where it's appropriate, but at the end of the day, I will do what is pleasing to the Lord at any cost. You couldn't do that before. And I can't do that of my own strength, but through the power of the Spirit we can. To the wasteful man, or to the uh, natural man, he condemns any such action. He condemns it aggressively. He condemns it vehemently. And his denial, understand this, watch this, his denial is actually rational. His denial is not irrational. It's rational because he has a presupposition or an a priori, beforehand, commitment to the rejection of God. And the issue is, if you have... A denial of God. You cannot know this. It is not accessible to you. And so here we are living in two different worlds. One where we see things that are invisible to the rest of the culture. And here you have critics who are condemning the work of the Holy Spirit. And then we need to understand that that condemnation of what the Holy Spirit is doing, that's blasphemy. And it turns out that for this community, any old blasphemy will do. Whereas the natural man can only appropriate knowledge through empirical or natural means, the Holy Spirit has provided believers with supernatural knowledge and understanding of truths that are beyond natural man's limits. They are literally otherworldly and incomprehensible to the non-believer. And yet it is those very truths that enable the believer to do supernatural things. If you ever grow weary... Just return to the well and draw again. If love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentle self-control, if they are the fruit of the Spirit, are they available to those without the Spirit? No. Each one of those, if you look at them, everyone in the list, they involve sacrifice. That means they have a cost. For the believer, we will never be exhausted in the practice of these attributes. We will always have enough for every good work. We can always draw from the infinite well, calling up on Him, calling on God to refill us. Do you know what? That pleases Him. He delights in us going back to Him and saying, I need more. I need more to do good. The non-believer, however, has a dry well. Apart from God, true sacrifice is unsustainable and irrational. Apart from God. For the non-believer, true sacrifice cannot rightly exist. This is the true foolishness. Jim Elliot says, he, who, uh, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. A Christian can understand what is to be gained and what is to be lost. And it's the polar opposite of the secular mind. Acceptable worship is the exclusive privilege of the believer. Those in opposition to God have nothing to offer that is pleasing to the Lord, nor are they concerned. Unless the Holy Spirit changes the heart, there is no hope. Yet, if you want to see a miracle, engage in biblical evangelism and see the dead come to life. Miracles still occur. You just have to see them. Time is short, but I have three passages from Scripture, and I'm just going to read them 
And the first one's going to be Ephesians chapter 5, 8 to 21. <clears throat> There's going to be some skipping. But it says this, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says this, Awake, you who are asleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly. You could not do that previously. Not as fools, but as wise. You could not do that previously. Redeem the time because the days are evil. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, but filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. I have a list in here of a whole bunch of things that you used to not be able to do, but now you can. So do them. If I had continued with Romans chapter 12, you would have seen more where it started out and it said, present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's your reasonable service. If you moved on to verse 9, it says things like this. Let love be without hypocrisy. That sentence right there has what? Feeling and truth. Right? There's a sense in which you can have something that's love but not rooted in truth. And you can have truth that may be not rooted in love. Those are not acceptable. The very next part says, watch this one. Abhor what is evil. You are called to feel abhorrence towards that which is displeasing to the Lord. That is the state. You are not to be passive. You're not to be somehow accepting or tolerant. Uh, be careful how we're talking about this. Your actions still have to be guided by the Holy Spirit. But the notion is, we are not at peace with evil. And we are not to be mild in our response internally in our spirit. It says in verse 17, Repay no one evil for evil. Well, back before the Holy Spirit, that's exactly what I would do because that makes sense, right? In fact, I'll, I'll double pay because that even makes better sense to my rational, secular mind. And the Lord is telling me what? Do things that are contrary to your nature because He has the source to cover all costs. In Galatians 5, <clears throat> Paul says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the, lust, uh, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. If we go to verse 19, it says, The works of the flesh are evident. So here we go, the bad list. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. This is a long list. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. There's still more. Guess what? When you were without the Holy Spirit... That was natural to you. That was stuff that you would just do at the drop of a hat because that was your nature. And the notion is what? You are not like that now. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. We've read those. In Grudem's notes, it says this. It's significant that the fruit of the Spirit includes many things that build community, whereas the works of the flesh destroy it. Relation and trust are either edifying or undermining. Edification is pleasing to the Lord. Invest in His work according to His effort. So here's my closing remarks. To be filled with the Spirit then is to yield our hearts to the authority of Christ, allowing His Word to dominate our attitudes and actions. His thoughts become the object of our meditation. His standards become our highest pursuit. And His will becomes our greatest desire. As we submit to God's truth, the Spirit leads us to live in a way that honors the Lord. Moreover, as the Holy Spirit sanctifies individual saints through the power of the Word, He energizes them to show love to one another within the corporate body of Christ without limit. To be sure, this load that you're called to carry will cost you. 
as a believer, it will be disproportionately heavy. You will be on the losing end every time. You are called to bear that burden. It's disproportionately heavy. It's unrelenting. It's thankless. It's lonely. It will cost you relationships. It will cost you heartbreak. It will cost you everything. Part of me says, I don't want to see you struggle like that. I would like to see this burden removed. But the right part of me says, that's a privilege. It is a privilege to be wrung out, to be used by God for His purposes, for His glory. It is our reasonable service. It is the least that we can do, but we don't bear it alone. He's there. And He says what? Don't get tired. Don't get weary. I have more. And in the end, will it be worth it? To figure out if you believe that or not. But to answer in the affirmative can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. May the world know us by the supernatural love we show one another in the name of Christ through the power of the Spirit for the glory of the Almighty God. Dear Heavenly Father,